want to welcome everybody to the first of a series of four public meetings that we're having uh, outside of the Capitol um, to uh, receive uh, public testimony regarding uh, the mission of our task force, which is to uh, come up with recommendations to the legislature uh, when the legislature reconvenes uh, for the second part of our uh, biennial session, and that would be on February 12th. So we are now um, in uh, a process where we are uh, uh, soliciting information from the public, uh, which will be used uh, by the task force uh, in developing recommendations to the legislature. That is our task. Uh, recommendations for uh, governance uh, structure changes, uh, if any, uh, to the Metropolitan Council. So uh, before we begin, though, I'd like to have, um, we have many of our task force members present, which I really appreciate, and I think we'll have a few uh, joining us remotely from the Capitol as well, um, but most of our task force is here. And um, uh, so what we'd like to do is just uh, introduce the members and um, uh, again, just uh, for context, uh, this task force was created by the legislature uh, in the uh, legislative session that just uh, concluded the first part of our biennial session, the 2023 portion of it. Um, and uh, so this is a legislatively directed uh, task force, which is a little different than uh, some previous uh, groupings that can have come together. Uh, to study Met Council governance. So this is the first time the legislature has uh, convened one, and we hope will result in um, some um, uh, important recommendations. So with that, I think we'll just start uh, here in the front row um, with uh, Commissioner Green, and then we'll go uh, from right to left. Uh, Commissioner Green. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, maybe say uh, any organizational affiliation or uh, uh, if you're an elected official, uh, introduce yourself that way. So, oh, thank you. yeah. Take two. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marion Green. I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner, and I am appointed as a as a citizen. But as it happens, I am an elected official. Commissioner. Good afternoon, I'm Carla Bigham. I'm Washington County Commissioner, and I was selected by the Association of Minnesota Counties, uh, who is a stakeholder uh, as part of the legislation that created this task force. Hello, I'm Representative Mark Weens. I represent uh, District 41A, which is in Washington County. Uh, I was selected by my caucus to uh, be a member of this task force. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mary Paddock. I'm uh, here to represent the public, and I was selected by the Legislative Coordinating Commission. I live in Minneapolis. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, maybe Mr. Rockwell next, yeah. Hi, I am Sam Rockwell. Uh, I am Executive Director of MOVE Minnesota, and MOVE Minnesota was uh, uh, listed in the legislation. Good afternoon, everyone. Renee Pereira-Webb. I was appointed by the AFL-CIO to represent all of the members, so all of the employees of the Met Council. Myra Norfield. Uh, I'm a law professor at the University of Minnesota, and I was a member of the Senate and the House, and I was the author of the last Metro reorganization in 1994 with Governor Plenty, who was the co-author. And you were appointed by? Uh, who, well, who I was chosen you? by the, uh, the Higher Education uh, 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 Council. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, OK, we have several members that are joining us online. I believe we've gotten to everybody who's here in person. Thank you for coming. We have a nice turnout today. Um, so I'm going to introduce the, the folks that are joining us online. and. Again, um, for those, if, if you joined us late, uh, it's, we have three of, our, three of my colleagues in the legislature joining us. Just maybe you could say who you are, where you represent, and uh, how you were appointed to this uh, committee. Uh, I'll start with Senator Coleman. Hi, can you hear me okay? Very well. Good, well, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I promise I am saving you all from a nasty virus going around right now. Um, my name's Julia Coleman. I represent Senate District 48, which is Waconia, East through Chanhassen. 
Uh, and prior to that, served on the Chanhassen City Council, where I kind of got firsthand experience working with the Metropolitan Council uh, and have been very interested in uh, reform and helping cities have a voice with that ever since. So I'm really honored to be on this task force. And yes, yeah, so and Senator Coleman was uh, appointed uh, by the Senate Republican Caucus. Um, uh, Senator Port. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Senator Lindsay Port. I represent District 55, which is Burnsville, Burnsville and Savage in the South Metro. And I was appointed by the Senate DFL Caucus. Great. And then our last member joining us online is Representative John Kosnick. Hi, Representative John Kosnick from Lakeville, representing Lakeville, Credit River, uh, Elko Newmarket, and Newmarket and Eureka Townships. Been in the legislature nine sessions, uh, have worked in uh, the Transportation Committee and State Government Finance, among others, and uh, look forward to hearing from the public today. And then um, we also have joining us from the Capitol, um, uh, the chair of the State Government Committee, uh, Representative Ginny Cleavorn. Representative Cleavorn, would you like to introduce yourself? Welcome and good afternoon. I am Representative Ginny Cleavorn. I represent Plymouth and Medicine Lake, and ha um, state and local government has jurisdiction over the Metropolitan Council. I am a legislative appointee. Thank you. And then we are joined by the vice chair of our uh, task force, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Pratt. I represent uh, the good people of Scott County, so Shakopee, Prior Lake, and Jordan. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Senator Pratt. So I'm just going to very briefly, before we dive right into the public testimony, um, just set the table a bit in terms of um, uh, I talked about why the uh, or how the Met Council Task Force was was appointed, you know, through legislation in 2023. But now I want to get to the why. Uh, we did this, and that is because, um, you know, the Metropolitan Council is a very important uh, regional entity uh, for, you know, for the Minneapolis-St. Paul region, uh, the seven-county region. And, um, you know, for those of you who, who may not be uh, familiar with the council, just, you know, very quickly, Cliff's Notes, um, it's responsible for uh, regional planning. Uh, they plan uh, growth in the metro area. Uh, the Met Council run, um, runs the, the transit system, uh, builds it, uh, operates it. Um, it creates plans for land use, uh, develops, uh, uh, approves the city's comprehensive plans, which also include um, you know, various zoning and, and housing uh, matters. Uh, they have a how, an HRA for housing. Um, uh, it's also, um, you know, uh, runs the wastewater treatment system regionally, uh, which is absolutely critical. Uh, there's also regional parks and planning and development. Uh, sorry about that. And um, again, through that HRA, they administer the Section 8 vouchers for, uh, for housing. Um, also approves the, the budget for airports. That's sort of a, a little known uh, piece of the, of the role of the Metropolitan Council, uh, the regional airport system. And so uh, currently the council has 16 members and one chair, all of them are appointed by the governor. And uh, one of the things that we've been talking about up till now in terms of our various meetings, uh, we've looked at different models from around the country for regional governance. Um, we have, you know, those have included uh, having council members directly elected. We've also, uh, which is done in Portland, Oregon. We've also looked at a model in Denver where you have uh, local elected officials comprised of the regional planning committee. Um, we have had uh, legislation uh, here in Minnesota that's been introduced several times, not passed into law. We've examined that legislation around staggering the terms of the Metropolitan Council. And then also as a corollary to that, um, having a more robust appointee appointment system where local uh, uh, officials nominate uh, the uh, members of the Metropolitan Council rather than uh, through the executive branch. And we've also had, uh, every, at the end of every meeting, we have uh, opportunity for public testimony. So several citizens have come uh, and uh, shared their ideas with us, and including 
uh, a couple that have said that uh, maybe a mixture of appointments and elected members would be a model. So, of course, there's many other ways to do this, and uh, we're really interested in, in some of your ideas. And so, um, uh, you know, we will have a, a report in a little over, uh, well, uh, just under two months from now. Uh, I was also introduce uh, Ms. Ms. Kohler, uh, who is staffing our task force. She's done an incredible job. And you know we're all here in this space because of the work that she's done to sort of set up the logistics. And before we get into this, I also want to have a thank you in absentia to Kristen Beckman, who is a member of the task force. Uh, many of you in St. Paul know her. She's been active in uh, the city. Uh, and um, is the governor's appointee to this task force. And it was really her idea that we have this particular location for a meeting, you know, here in the East Metro, here in the city of St. Paul. And unfortunately she can't join us, but she's traveling, but she did incredible work in terms of contacting many of you uh, and, and uh, really appreciate um, Ms. Beckman's uh, role in this. And, um, uh, and I think really helped us with our uh, initial testifiers. So uh, that's that's it by way of introduction. Uh, Vice Chair Pratt, do you have anything that you wanted to add before we get right into it? Yeah, you have to. Got to turn it on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, I think I think uh, Representative Hornstein covered it all very well. You know, one of the things I think that we're looking at is making sure that we have a body that represents the entire region. Um, and we understand that, you know, there are differences between, say, the priorities of uh, the, the urban core uh, versus, say, some of the suburbs and trying to make a balance of that and why we're doing these listening sessions so we can maybe hear where those commonalities might be um, that we can continue to build on. I've been extremely impressed with the, the membership really trying to come together and, and work on this. It's, it's been a, uh, some of us have been working on it for a few years, some of us have been working on it close to 30 years, and, um, uh, but really we wanna have a, a, a solution that represents everyone uh, in the community and everyone and, and, and all the communities within it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt, and uh, Senator Pratt's been a wonderful partner to work with and, uh, I like the fact that we have kind of a, a bipartisan uh, leadership. That was something that our uh, task force wanted in terms of moving forward here. So um, uh, with that, let's get going. Let's get the show on the road. And uh, in terms of our format, we did ask uh, four uh, people from St. The, the St. Paul and environs uh, to start us off today. Uh, and. Um, gave them just a, we're, we're gonna have every, the, the testifiers will have you get two minutes each. Uh, we gave our, our uh, initial testifiers a little, a little bit more time uh, than that, just so uh, they can kind of kickstart us, help us uh, set the table for uh, this meeting. Uh, and then, but I'm not gonna be too rigid on the two minutes, but just really try to, to keep it short, uh, uh, you know, as, as the public is testifying. So we're gonna start with these four folks and then I have a list of the people that uh, signed up ahead of time, and it, I think we'll have some time here at the end if you if people did not sign up ahead of time but want to testify, we can make that accommodation. Uh, but I but we will really want to keep everyone's uh, comments uh, as crisp as possible so that we can get everybody in. And um, so uh, with that, I'd like to first call on Ramsey County Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt. Uh, and just by way of introduction, um, Commissioner Reinhardt um, has represented District 7 on the county board since being elected in 1996. She has an MBA in Business Administration from Metro State and a doctorate in Public Administration from Hamlin. So I think you're pretty well qualified to <laughs> give us a little uh, jump start to our, our, uh, our hearing here. Thank you. Oops. Yeah, and, and for folks, this is a, 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 I like this arrangement that we normally don't have public testifiers facing everybody, uh, but this is really a nice arrangement. So, uh, and members of the public will also be testifying from this podium. Okay, now I've got it turned on, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As stated, I'm Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt, 
And I'm really pleased to be testifying here today at the first public engagement hearing, and I know that you've got, I think, three others. Um, with this session here in St. Paul and Ramsey County, it is great to see everyone here and really looking at um, all of the outreach to community that we're gonna be able to get through this one and the other public engagements. I've been around this Metropolitan Council topic for years, many years before I was a county commissioner. In fact, I think, I, I know Dr. Orfield, you and I talked about it, and that was probably about 30 years ago. <laughs> Um, and so it's been around for a long time. And at the time I was with the Metropolitan Council, there were only a couple hundred people that worked there and that was all basically in planning. And so it was during the transition, actually I was transitioned from the Met Council, they spun off the solid waste management, uh, the garbage. Um, and um, anyhow, and I went to the state of Minnesota to the Office of Environmental Assistance. And some of you uh, that are in the room know my background in the environmental field and I feel very passionate about that. But um, I, I also studied, uh, so not only was I a Met Council staff person, but I, I studied the governance structure as part of my master's degree at uh, Metropolitan State University. So I, I know that you all know this, but I want to make sure that I say it on the record, that you have an important task before you. And on behalf of the Ramsey County Board, I want to thank you for your service and your attention to this important regional matter and hope that some real reform can pass the legislature this coming season. And I am not only hopeful, but I really believe that it will happen. I want to thank Commissioner Bigham for her service and convening a kitchen cabinet of the Metro counties. Ramsey County Commissioner Rafael Ortega participates in that regularly. Uh, with our chief of staff to the county manager, Elizabeth Tolzman. Unfortunately, neither of them could be here today, but I jumped at the chance. So <laughs> the Ramsey County Board held a board workshop on November 28th, and we discussed the various options for governance and operations with a keen eye on how Ramsey County and the East Metro and our residents are affected. Just as a reminder, Ramsey County has a population of over 550,000 people and is the second most populous county in the state, and it only has 170 square miles. It is the smallest geographically, it's the most diverse, and it's predominantly suburban. So those 550,000 represent about 10% of the state's residents. Providing services regionally where it, where it makes sense is key, and I wanna repeat that. We do need to look at many areas and keep the regional approach but there is a lack of transparency and accountability at times with the current structure, which is what brings us all here today. Our first preference from the county board is to see a council of governments model with each of the seven metro counties having one spot with the governor appointing the rest of the 10 members, including the chair. These districts should continue to be based on population as they are right now. And this is just one of the models, but we really believe that this is one that um, has a, a good mix of folks and moves forward. Uh, but moving into the operations, I shouldn't have said but, um, moving into the operations really does matter. We would like to see the housing vouchers moved 100% to the counties. We all have HRAs and it makes sense to have them there. I would point out that there is strong consensus from county administrators and managers from across the region for this move. A lot of what we are talking about these days is the oversight of transit funding and operations. We believe there is a good, some good in separating our planning, engineering, design, and operations of Metro Transit uh, to, from Metro Transit. Some more specifics on initial thoughts and ideas are, Transit planning should be carried out by the MPO and should reside in the COG slash MPO organization. There is likely value in having some separation between the transit operation and the transit planning, however. Project planning and design are carried out in partnership with the counties and Metro Transit. Having been close to many of these projects, staff and commissioners would like, to, would like to say that it works reasonably well. Construction of major transitway projects is where the council really needs to reestablish credibility because that's really what we're talking about here. There are two likely ways 
either a better model of substantive oversight, hopefully accomplished with the COG model, or considering shifting the construction over to MnDOT because they run major road projects. With that, I would just like to say again, thank you for your time today, and Ramsey County stands ready to assist in the weeks ahead should you want more input. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Reiner, for your insights, and uh, I know that um, task force members may want to follow up with you, and you're always available for that. Um, our next uh, testifier, I'm so pleased is here with us today. Um, uh, council Member Mitra Jalali is a council member for Ward 4 in St. Paul, and so also represents the city of St. Paul at the Met Council Transportation Advisory Board. And um, she's been serving St. Paul since 2018, and I'm just, on a, on a personal note, I just really appreciate all of your partnership over so many years, uh, particularly on issues of uh, transit and equity and, and social justice. So. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Mitra Jalali. I am a councilwoman for um, the Midway St. Paul and all of the surrounding neighborhoods in Ward 4. I'm so happy to be here today. I want to keep my remarks um, really framed around the context I serve in because it fully relates to what the Met Council does and what we're talking about today. Um, I'm a local elected official. I am on the front lines of local government, and my level of government is responsible for everyday services that thousands of everyday people use. Um, streets, uh, you know, the trash system. Sometimes in St. Paul we have conversations about that. Um, you know, the uh, housing options available to you, the local business you go to to get coffee or to meet somebody or to grab a snack or to eat um, or to wash your laundry. Um, it often feels like everything that's happening in our communities, I am the person that neighbors know they can go to, even if it's not necessarily within my purview, um, that's what it's like to be a local elected official. And I also sit in these spaces within and adjacent to the Met Council where they're still overseeing all those everyday close to people systems, but it feels very removed from everyday people. It doesn't feel accessible. Um, it doesn't feel like the way that issues are even talked about is understandable. There's jargon, um, there's long range plans, there's big picture like technical language and we need to democratize these spaces. We just, we have to shift the culture of them and I don't think without a governance change that that will happen. So, um, you know, I represent a part of the community that has had like a lion's share of new construction in the city. Um, Green Line comes into, Mini or into St. Paul from Minneapolis through my ward. Uh, there's so much that has changed in St. Paul overall for the better uh, in the ward that I've represented because of these investments in transit and in more modern infrastructure and amenities and options for our residents. And also, and I'm really happy because I see my constituents here today and I'm very clear on what they expect and what their values are. My constituents want us to act on the climate crisis and on the affordability and equity crisis in this state with urgency. And lots of times these spaces from the Met Council to the Transportation Advisory Board, they're doing important work and it feels like the pace of the work and the connection to everyday people is like much too long, much too slow, removed from the immediacy of the air we're breathing and the you know, transportation options we have. So uh, I feel like I'm kind of here to just like kick the door in and be like, please let's make it better and fast and make it more connected to everyday people. Um, I want the folks who depend on the systems that we use the most to feel like it's there for them. And so often that dynamic is uh, the opposite. It feels like, you know, the system is up here and I'm down here. So, um, so let's change it and uh, let's really make this structure much more rooted in the experiences of everyday people, much more accountable. Um, I would love for everyone to have that level of accessibility. I would, I would love for my Met counselor, for example, to feel like they're just one phone call or message away in the same way that I am for my constituents, um, especially when a lot of those calls come to me about the light rail station or what's happening at the day shelter or how we're doing all these things right to support our neighbors. Um, not just like our residents, our community, but our neighbors. We share this, we share this state together, and I know it can be better. So this is uh, the thoughts I have to frame us up. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and share my experiences today. Thank you so much, Council Member um, Jalali. Next, I'd like to invite Veronica Burt uh, up, and I'm very, very happy that um, 
Uh, Veronica Burt is with us. Uh, she is the executive director of the Dayton's Bluff Community Council, um, so has a very good uh, base in the community to talk about uh, the Met Council. But uh, also prior to that, um, uh, she played a very key role in um, the, uh, uh, some issues around University Avenue uh, as it relates to um, the Green Line. Uh, there was a campaign called Stops for Us where people from this community uh, were interested in having better access to that new major infrastructure. And there were also issues around business, uh, business concerns around uh, the construction of the Green Line here. Uh, neighborhood branding, residential hiring, uh, all of those were um, you know, key issues as this uh, line was um, constructed. And Veronica Burt was at the center of a lot of that. And so I really appreciate your perspective, both as a, a neighborhood leader currently in Dayton's Bluff, but your past work on the Green Line in this very community. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I think um, I would like to really uh, start my remarks with, um, you know, given a really tangible uh, community-based uh, perspective in interfacing with the Metropolitan Council. And again, these are, these are my personal remarks from a lot of my experience, um, you know, dealing with large infrastructure uh, projects in a community. Um, I was an organizer at that time, uh, a cultural organizer in the historic African-American Rondo community. And, um, you know, because of that community's very unique experience with I-94 and that infrastructure, they had a very long memory, you know, of the devastation that could happen, um, especially when you're not listening to community voices. And so I, I guess you could say we're kind of the canary in the coal mine. Um, and so at the time when we saw the light rail project coming down University Avenue, it raised a lot of those memories and concerns. And so we took very full heartedly in analyzing what the impacts of that project was gonna be. And in so doing, you know, as we read uh, very meticulously through the, the planning documents of the project, we realized very early that the project was failing to talk directly to the, uh, uh, the impacted folks along the alignment, particularly the environmental justice community. So that was one very critical flaw of the project at the time. And as we interfaced with the planners and the Metropolitan Council, um, we were finding ourselves um, certainly at a, uh, at a crossroads in trying to connect and relate uh, to the project, to the planners, to the Metropolitan Council. And, uh, you know, as the project moved along and we tried to raise concerns of, you know, analyzing critically the impacts of, you know, constructing the project and its effect on businesses, you know, mostly small minority businesses, immigrant businesses, and then the ancillary effects um, into the neighborhood, you know, realizing that the light rail project was not just a transit project, but it also had intersections with um, economic development, housing, and so forth. And so we brought along uh, the concerns of, you know, gentrification. You know, when you bring in improvements like this in a low-income environmental justice community, those are the risks. And not that anyone was against, you know, redevelopment and revitalization, but that we wanted, uh, you know, for the project to be critically looked at and analyzed and solutions to be put in place very early in which we could be beneficiaries of the long-term advantages such a project was to bring. And because we weren't getting the kind of uh, listening ear of the Metropolitan Council, we found ourselves um, having to sue the project in the federal courts and having to bring in a, uh, uh, a, um, a entity of, of kind of equal or, or, or a more um, you know, substantial weight of power bearing to the discussion. 
And uh, we found that in so doing, then we had the ear of the federal government, we had the ear of the local planning um, body uh, that created the kinds of um, uh, shifts we needed to occur in that project. And in so doing, um, you know, we did get uh, mitigation for the businesses to help those businesses stay in place and thrive. And we really feel to this day, if we didn't put the kind of energy and activity uh, into that project, you know, you, you may not see a number of these businesses that are even still um, here in the community. Um, and in addition to that, you know, a lot of the other issues that we brought along uh, into that conversation um, where we wanted to have local residents to be sure that they were hired, you know, as part of that project. So, you know, that was a benefit um, that we were able to have uh, create cultural corridors so that our communities could stay in place and thrive um, and, and have people get lifted up out of poverty and not lifted up out of the neighborhood. So those are very long-term, you know, visionary uh, types of initiatives, but um, nonetheless, they were initiatives that required our local unit of government to be very thoughtful and planful and help us put not only, uh, 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 pro uh, I would say not only uh, opportunities in place, but protections. So you had to look from both of those lenses, uh, especially with an environmental justice community that has a lot of uh, long-term and built-in vulnerabilities. Um, and I would say that uh, our experience, particularly with the Metropolitan Council, was very uh, challenging in trying to raise those issues. Um, and I do distinctly uh, remember that even at the point in which we did file our lawsuit and, and brought forth our complaint before a federal judge, it was very unfortunate and, and a very sad um, uh, reflection, I think, on the Metropolitan Council that citizens you know, uh, exercising their citizenship right. Uh, we found ourselves at the courtroom, you know, being guarded by transit guard dogs. <laughs> and, and that was a very, um, especially for a civil rights community, that was a very, uh, again, an additional, uh, I think, barrier and an additional uh, reflection of how the Metropolitan Council was not a very, um, easy body to engage with as citizens, um, and that they weren't really a body uh, that was absorbing of our comments and um, helping to, to uh, transform um, that project, uh, certainly to the level in which, in which we need it. So it was our experience at that time, um, again, was very challenging, and, and I would think from a citizenship uh, perspective such as that, you know, it may be best to really closely look at the Metropolitan Council as being an, an elected body in which they have to um, sit down and really kind of hear what their constituents are saying. I think being so removed from everyday folks made it very easy for our comments to land on, on deaf ears, which really forced us uh, to appeal to a higher authority at that time. So those are my, my, my comments as a citizen and uh, thank you for opening up this discussion and in, in, inviting um, you know, this perspective. Uh, thank you and thanks for, again, that environmental justice uh, perspective that you bring. Um, so our last sort of introductory uh, uh, testifier is um, uh, Russ Stark, who has been, he is currently the chief resilience officer with the city of St. Paul. And um, so he leads a lot of the climate and sustainability work here in the city. Um, and he served uh, for 10 years on the St. Paul City Council as well, uh, including three years as council president. And for eight years, he was on the transportation advisory board. So again, a very deep um, understanding here of the the issue that we are talking about today. And welcome, uh, Russ Stark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the task force. Thanks for having us here today. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, if you could maybe lift the mic up a little bit. And yeah, great, thank you. You 
know, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody, glad to be here. Um, you know, a couple of things to start out with. Um, first of all, I work in the mayor's office. I'm not representing the views of the mayor here today. I'm representing the, my own views as someone who's worked with the council in various capacities over, over 20 years. Um, second, I'm just going to get right to the point and then describe how I got there a little bit. And, and the point is, I'm not going to make a specific recommendation about governance structure today, but rather kind of give you some sense of through my experience, where the direction that I think need, things need to go in order to, to be somewhat improved. Um, that said, I would say in all those capacities that I've worked with the Met Council over many years, first as a employee of a small nonprofit, uh, trying to influence some decision making at the time about the green line in its earliest stages of planning, and then as a council member and, and now in the mayor's office, um, a, lot, a lot has actually gone right. Um, but in the way that Veronica described, the pathway to get to the right thing has often been very circuitous um, and has needed to have lots of different influences and influencers from community and other places to get to that right conclusion. Um, so when thinking about what the governance structure of the council should ultimately look like, I think the key question is what does success look like for the region? Um, Chair, Co-Chair Pratt mentioned the sometimes different perspectives of urban and suburban communities. I mean, we've got different perspectives on the block here, right? Um, that's, that's always going to be the case. Um, but, but to me, success looks like a region where uh, the sum of the parts are actually, uh, the whole is actually doing more than the sum of the parts, um, and that, and that uh, a transit system um, a water treatment system is serving everyone um, better than it could if it was, uh, you know, just serving individual communities and disaggregate. I mean, I think that's the whole reason that the council exists. Um, and so, how how can the council get things right even more often, and maybe uh, on a clearer pathway? I think is is the question. Um, and I would say, with those key kind of concepts of uh, improving credibility, accountability, and transparency at the council. Um, my experience has been it can be challenging to work with the council in terms of figuring out who, who the decision maker actually is. Um, and uh, in that sense, it's not necessarily at sort of the highest level about like whether or not a massive transit project is going to happen, but more at the like um, smaller project level of the day-to-day -day of trying to improve transit operations and things, um, it can feel like um, our, our public body is trying to get better service or a, a thing that we think will be better for our community. And we are negotiating with a person at the staff level who may or may not have the authority to actually do the thing that we're asking them to do. It feels that way all the time. And it, the, the governance structure won't necessarily solve that, but I think it's a problem that needs to be, that needs to be addressed. I've worked for most of my career in government in an organization in a, in a strong mayor system city where uh, the council has the purse and policy, but where there's a very clear sort of line of authority for decision making. And the, and the council has often struck me as largely the opposite of that. Um, the, the regional plan um, that the council does and updates uh, every few years, uh, including the transit plan, can often seem like an amalgamation of ideas and artifacts of different ideas about projects that have been exist in existence maybe for 10, 20, or 30 years, rather than a vision. Um, and I think we've got to get to that point of having a regional vision um, that we can all kind of implement together in spite of those differences and challenges. Um, in the absence of it, it's all, it all just feels like we're, um, we're working together, but we're doing it exclusively at the project level, and, and we lose sight of the, of the big picture uh, very often. Um, I think account, to, to improve accountability, ultimately that accountability needs to get closer to the local level, to the, to the council member's point. Today, the, 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 the folks who are ultimately accountable for the performance of the council are the governor and the legislature. And it's it, no aspersions on any governor or any legislator, that's too far away. It's, it's too far away from the local, very local and regional decisions that are, that are being made um, here on the ground. Um, and so 
Uh, the other key concept I want to put forward, I, I did serve for eight years on the what's called the TAB, the Transportation Advisory Board of the Met Council. The TAB is made up of local electeds and, uh, and just appointed members from around the region helping the council make decisions about how to spend federal transportation money. One of the limitations, I would say, of the TAB structure is that there is not proportional representation by population. I experienced that firsthand as a TAB member quite a bit, um, where the, well, with all due respect to the idea about the, the COG and trying to kind of balance the need to have every county have a seat at the table, those counties have very different populations, right? And so the, there needs to be a thoughtful approach to that, to that idea of proportional representation, whatever, whatever the solution might be. Um, and finally, I would say, and I, this, I thought about this quite a bit uh, thinking about today's remarks, and I think that um, with greater accountability, personally, I would feel comfortable actually also giving a future council more authority. Um, I think sometimes the council doesn't have quite enough of it, particularly on the land use side, and you can't really do a transit system in the absence of land use that's going to support and accommodate um, good transit. And so I, th I think that should be the flip side of this conversation. Uh, I, think, I think the governance should get closer to the ground and then we should actually um, imbue it with a bit more authority um, to do the important work that we needed to do. Um, so those were the thoughts I wanted to share today. Again, appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you and look forward to the rest of, this, of the discussion and testimony today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I really, the four of you really kicked us off in a wonderful way with your insights and your experience, vast experience. And each of you really brings an important perspective to the discussion. So just as a warm up, this is sort of, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the way we want to proceed with people kind of uh, giving us your views based on your personal experience and, and perspective. So. Um, just a reminder, um, this hearing will last till four o'clock, and we really want to, we have a long list, we have uh, 25 or so people, so we really want to make sure every testifier keeps it to our two-minute limit, uh, and um, with that, our first uh, person is Paul Mandel. Is Paul here? You know, sometimes we have people on the list and they don't come, so that will expedite things a little bit. Well, if Paul Mandel is um, not available, we'll go right to Jill Smith. Is Jill here? Okay, all right. Well, maybe the third, uh, or third is a charm. Is Damon Dean here? Yay, okay. Uh, <laughs> welcome, and uh, please state your name and any quick background information that you want to share with us and then proceed with your testimony. Certainly. My name is Damon Dean and I just uh, received an email um, about this and I thought I'd like to hear what is going to be said. So I didn't really, until I read the fine print, <laughs> saw that I was, had an opportunity to actually testify a little bit. And I did have an opportunity to talk to one of the members of the task force just before this meeting. She just, just agreed at me and commented on, one person commented on my shirt. So we just got to talking and and then the next thing, you know, um, I'm talking about what I was thinking I'd like to hear be said here. And I think you all did a great job kicking it off. Um, I don't know if you saw my head nodding when you were talking. I was like, oh my God, they're saying it. And it's nice to hear. Um, I come from having grown up just across the street from Central High School. So this is kind of my neighborhood. Um, I went to McAllister College and um, married my high school sweetheart. I went to St. Paul Academy. So um, I know some of the members of the task force. Uh, in fact, my kids went to school with some of the people that are on the task force, or not task force, but on the council. What I want to talk about is my experience that I had in attending two meetings at the council, in particular, the CDC. I think I'm getting the acronyms right and everything. But um, what I saw was something similar that I saw in the city of Minneapolis when we were looking to on a, an organization that I volunteer for and now on the board on. We're trying to get um, housing developed in the area. And in particular, we were talking with this, um, in this case, about housing vouchers, particular project-based vouchers, and the importance there. And what I saw happen at this meeting happened at the city council meeting in Minneapolis, where um, we were applying for the affordable housing trust fund dollars through Minneapolis, 
And they were gonna fund about 10 projects. There were 18 of them. We finished fourth. And with the rubric that they used to determine the ranking, we didn't get funding. And we were just flabbergasted with that. How can that be? And we went, we, um, that was just when the pandemic was like in month seven. And um, holidays were getting ready to start up. But Zoom was available. So we were able to meet with like, within a week's time before the city council was gonna vote on approving the projects, we were able to meet with about seven of the city council members and the mayor. I don't think that would have happened had there not been a pandemic to get that many people together. But the opportunity to be able to talk to them and then hear their perspectives, it became very clear that staff drove a lot of the decisions. Staff is wonderful, you need staff. But they're not the ones, in particular with the city of Minneapolis that are elected and talking about housing, what's needed in areas. And to hear that our project didn't get funded because of that. Fast forward to just a couple of months ago, sitting in listening to um, the presentations about trying to get project-based vouchers, again, we were hearing that staff had numbers that were kind of confusing to the council members themselves. And we were listening to them ask questions and clarifications, but then they turned around and rubber stamped it anyway. Um, and they decided not to offer those project-based vouchers, but they weren't asking the critical thinking questions that I think that if there was elected members on the council that were accountable to a community and accountable to people and had more sort of skin in the game a little bit, that they might have taken some of the issues that you four brought up to heart. And what I saw was, um, the question was like, why are the vouchers, you have a certain percentage of vouchers you wanna give out, how come you're not hitting that target? And that was asked by one of the council members, but the answer by the staff member was, well, we don't have the capacity to do that and reach our goal. And we were asking as an organization for even a higher percentage of those project-based vouchers to be given out. And we heard, you know, the, the vouchers are given back to um, after a certain period of time. Or there's, um, they wanna have choice. And I'm sorry, if you know anything about project-based vouchers, well, there's the illusion of choice, but there's not much choice. And the choice isn't there because there aren't any places for them to use them. But if you had project-based vouchers, there would be the place to use them. And I, I'm gonna give you an extra yes. minute because you, the first two weren't here. Okay. But if you could wrap up. Here. And I'll wrap up. I just wanted to share more from the perspective of having just sat in there. I did testify the first time at that meeting about why we need project-based vouchers, but hearing and seeing the way the process went, I felt powerless as a person going in there on an organization that develops housing itself and has to jump through so many hoops in order to be able to get the funding to do this. And um, I just really think that if we're gonna be having an organization that has so much power in making policy and so many dollars to do this, that they should be held to some sort of accountability standards that elections would happen to, to provide. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for your insights and your work. Um, next up, we have Carla Sand. Is Carla here? Okay. Um, Carl Hedlund, Move Minneapolis. Okay, maybe we'll hear from some of these folks. Uh, oh, here you are, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so Carl is not here. Why don't you come on up and give us your comments? This is you are Lucid Thomas, uh, Hamway Midland, Co uh, Hamway Midway Coalition. That's great. And St. Anthony Park Community Council. Welcome. But Hello. also, just please state your name as well. Uh, yes. Hi. I'm Lucid Thomas. Um, and yes, I am a tenant organizer at the Hamlin Midway Coalition and St. Anthony Park Community Council. Um, and I just wanted to talk briefly about um, the constituents in Ramsey County because in my work, I've learned that over 60,000 uh, households in Ramsey County are cost burdened. So what that means is they spend 30% uh, or more of their income on housing costs. And I mean, that's just the, the statistics of it. I have a feeling the people who spend 29% on their household costs don't really uh, care much about that distinction. You know, it's still a struggle. And I guess just what I wanted to emphasize is having, you know, worked with these groups is right now people really don't see these mechanisms as a way that they can get change, especially for people who are cost burdened. They're working so hard to make ends meet um, that 
accessibility piece, which uh, Ms. Veronica Burt, Burt uh, spoke very greatly on, is having that community input um, and you know making uh, the time to go to these people who are really struggling because it's it's hard for them uh, to even know how to begin to interact with with these entities and. Um, you know, I also want to, you know, put a face to that because I feel like we say, oh, you need to go into the community a lot, but you know, what does that look like? I mean, that's door knocking, that's having events. And, you know, I, th I think that is something that comes naturally with elections. Um, but whatever decision is made, I think that those aspects need to be a big part of the Met Council is, is actually going into those neighborhoods, uh, listening to people, taking down uh, you know, what they have to say and, uh, and demonstrating ways that it is being implemented in, in the policies and decisions being made. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next we have Sana Wazwaz. Okay. Um, Gary Todd. Okay. Well, you're welcome to speak if you want, but I, I understand if you, if your perspective has already been uh, uh, stated here. Marilyn Bach. Okay. Uh, uh, Jim Shetler. Yeah. Welcome back. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Mr. Chairman, Jim Shuttler, I live in St. Paul and I'm a member of a group called Citizen Advocates for Regional Transit. Um, two minutes is uh, a bit brief. I, I could do two hours. Well, you, uh, I'm not gonna give you two hours, but since we've had, <laughs> since we've had a few cancellations, um, you could, I'll, I'll give you four, how's that? Well, that's, that's wonderful, I appreciate okay. that very much. Um, I'll, I'll stick to just a few things. And we'll provide some written uh, comments to go into a lot more detail on things. Um, uh, first off, as uh, Mr. Chairman, as you've mentioned, we, I, I've been able to attend uh, several of the meetings of the task force, and uh, you've gone to two of the premier metropolitan organizations in the country, Portland, Oregon, and, and Denver, Colorado. And I'm, I'm wondering, though, if you noticed what I noticed, and that is, compared to the Metropolitan Council, they don't do that much. The Met Council does an awful lot more than either of those put together. And this is the key thing that, that I, I hope the task force keeps in mind. You have an extraordinary apparatus that has evolved over 56 years now. And uh, it's something that made sense to be appointed at the beginning. It was sort of under the guardianship of, of the governor at that time. But it's long since, with the acquisition of a lot more responsibilities, become an organization that needs to be elected and directly accountable to, to the public. So I want to start with, with that point. Uh, uh, as you deliberate what has to be done, uh, keep in mind the many things this organization has done in the past. And I, uh, I was on the staff of the Met Council from 71 to 87, so I had some view of this. Um, the airport, at one time we had four township-sized uh, 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 marks on the map of the metropolitan area for a future metropolitan airport. Tremendously controversial. The Met Council took charge of this and, and made the decision that it is best to keep it central so you don't favor one side over the other of the region. And with quieter air, aircraft, it has worked out pretty well. Um, Interstate 94, we had proposed two uh, four-lane superhighways going through Washington County, Hudson Road and Interstate 94. It was the Met Council that decided that's crazy, it's going to be one. Um, a number of other uh, uh, things I, I can, list, uh, can list, but Met Council has been active in just a lot of different things. We wouldn't have the Mississippi River, the uh, National Mississippi River Recreation Area, uh, without having started with the critical area designation which was done by the Metropolitan Council. Many other things uh, like that. So um, a, a very important agency with a lot of capability. 
Second, um, as I've indicated, it should be elected. No question about that. It made sense in the past. It doesn't make sense today. We need that direct accountability with the public. And, and um, third, as, as an elected body, this is a full-time job. There are a lot of folks saying, well, we have to have uh, 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 mayors, we have to have county commissioners, we have to have city council members, and so forth. Uh, that is not fair to those people. It's not fair to the public. This is a full-time job. If, if people are going to be out there talking to the constituents, constituents being mayors, city councilmen, and so forth, as well as individuals like we've already heard uh, uh, today, um, that's a full-time job, and they need to, need to be compensated accordingly. And they have, they, there, there's so much they have to learn about the, the activities the council is currently involved in, and then all the new stuff that constantly keeps coming. So I just hope that the task force will keep these things in mind and uh, we'll provide a few more details later. Thank wow, you. Wow, you were amazing. You had nine seconds to spare, so. <laughs> um, thank you, I've, I've really appreciated your engagement with this task force and your, your attendance at our meetings and your, and your insights, thank you. Uh, is Sarah Musgrave here? Okay. okay, all right. Well, again, if, if you change your mind, you're welcome. Um, Abu Naim, okay, you're next up. Welcome, and state your name for the record and proceed. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Abu Naim, and uh, I'm a St. Paul resident, community advocate, and board member of the Hamlin Midway Coalition. I would like to share my traumatic experience with the transit police, their response, and my recommendation. On September 12th, I was riding the Green Line around 10 p.m. A fight directly uh, broke out with a clear agitator. Several stocky passengers broke up the fight. The passengers told the agitator to leave at the next stop. The agitator refused, which led to a scuffle outside the train car. That is when the Metro Transit Police got involved. One of the passengers came back in the car with clear signs of facial irritation, possibly from alleged mace. An officer came into the car came into the passenger car seeking to detain him. The passengers clearly expressed to the officer that, um, uh, that the person was not responsible for the incident, but the officer did not listen. The officer then um, forcefully detained him, which led to him getting tased, and he was partially dragged out of the car. His friend was obviously upset and uh, started to moth off to the officer and he also got arrested even though he did not do any physical aggression toward the officer. When I thought the, the incident was over, there was an officer, the, the doors were about to close and there was an officer that opened the door and he was not involved in any of the incidents and he came in and went he stood in front of the aisle, in front of the passengers, and said, does anyone else want to speak up? He was threatening the passengers in the car. And there was a, a white woman that said, leave. And the officer repeated himself, does anyone want to speak up? And she repeated, leave again. And, uh, and then the officer left. In this experience, it, it really frustrated me that I was experiencing police brutality and I couldn't do anything about it. It was this close that I was about to lose my cool and just explode. And of course, this is racialized. The folks who was defending the folks in the train were people of color. And, uh, sorry. So on the following day, 
I, 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 sent, I filed a complaint to the Metro Transit Police. The respondent on the line displayed no empathy for the gravity of the situation. Even though I made a direct request to provide uh, information about the incident, including the incident number and the badge number of the officers, I was not given any of that. They stated that it will take several weeks to months to get back to me. To this day, I have not heard any word of them about this incident. If I have taken a video of the officers escalating and intimidating passengers in the car, the city would be burned down and immediate disciplinary action would have taken, uh, would have been taken place. The tragedy of George Floyd's murder was not an isolated incident but the direct result of an administration not holding officers accountable for misconduct. I recommend the Met Council to implement a civilian oversight of the Metro Transit Police and, and adjustments to the complaint process. Thank you for listening, and I'll be willing to participate in genuine reform. Thank you for sharing your story. Very appreciated. Um, Next, we have uh, Cameron Fury, also from the Hamlin Midway Coalition. It's Cameron here. Okay. Gene uh, Dietman. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I did see John Dillery earlier. John, did you want to share anything? Okay. Any, and if you have any organizational affiliations you wanna share, please state your name for the record and proceed. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, very well. Thanks so much for organizing this. This reminds me of the famous Norman Rock while painting freedom of speech. You're all familiar with it. You learn about it in grade school. If you haven't seen it, take a look. Man speaking with his community to people he trusts people who are accountable to him, elected officials. I've heard a lot of great things here this evening, today, or this afternoon. Uh, I live in South Minneapolis. I'm a chair of the local neighborhood environment committee, uh, supporter of various uh, organizations, uh, Move Minnesota, all that stuff. I worked over four decades as a transit planner. That's a fancy name for a bus route designer at Metro Transit and was a uh, co-planner on the Green Line Connecting Bus Service plan, in case you uh, enjoyed that in its original form, not in its watered down form. Anyway, uh, on the subject of metro governance, I went to many dozens, countless uh, public meetings as part of my work over the years, and just talking to neighbors and friends and coworkers, ordinary people, people that aren't necessarily uh, sophisticated academically, or, uh, you know, understand the insides of, met of governance at all, but you might think of them as the outsiders who do care about metro governance and all government. Uh, uh, I, I've heard some really strong consensus over all the years. I'd be talking at a meeting about bus planning, but as you know, people come and talk to you about something they want to talk about, and you often get off subject. And that can be good. And Metro Governance, the Metro Council in particular, would come up quite a lot. And what I heard was, ordinary people have a trust issue with the Metro Council as it's now set up because it's appointed. I have never heard in all the years of dozens and dozens of comments, anybody say that they did not want a Metro Council. Au contraire, they want a stronger central metro council that gets things done, and they really want the metro council to do all the things like regional planning on for inter-county, if you will, plans. It doesn't make sense for them. These people would never say, well, yeah, let my city do all the planning, you know, even though the line, the transit line is going out in the suburbs. No, people have common sense. People always, people would always say, it's a strong consensus, my gosh. Uh, 
why does the governor appoint these people? Why does the governor appoint the chair of the Metro Council? If that makes sense, then the governor should appoint the mayor of Minneapolis. The governor should appoint the mayor of St. Paul. And if you're in favor of that, fine. But I never heard anyone say why it should be done. Straight talk, common sense, to the point. We need a stronger, effective metro governance for metropolitan affairs. People need a building block approach, and they want that. They want their community government, their neighborhood associations, to be effective and listened to. But they also want them to coordinate together to the city. They want the city government to be effective and get things done in a just and equitable way, listening to the community councils. They want the city governments to be coordinated and accountable to the county governments. See, it's going up the structure. They want the county governments to coordinate their cities. They want the Metropolitan Council to be built on the counties as participants. So the idea is, what if you had uh, extra, I don't know, they're not the expert, but I'd hear things like the county commissioners, there should be extra county commissioners who are also Metro Council representatives and they're elected. These, or, and it's based on population perhaps. So, you know, the seven counties aren't gonna all have the same number of representatives because they have such different populations as is very well pointed out here. And so you have this elected group through the counties. The chair of the Metropolitan Council is elected at large by all the people of the participant counties. And uh, perhaps the terms are staggered. One thing I heard a lot about too over the years, this final point, is a big problem with having the governor appoint uh, this critical, do so much regional body is that governors change. And there's been a lot of frustration over the years and a lack of continuity of planning vision. <laughs> this governor is understanding of Metro affairs, progressive about them, wants to see of success and is very supportive of the council's work. This new governor doesn't really understand Metro affairs or doesn't give it much a priority and there's a lurch in a different direction. You simply can't do long-term planning that way that's effective and just and equitable. Long-term vision required. Elected Metropolitan Council required. Elected chair required. And the governor should be, uh, go back to being in the role of statewide office strictly. And thank that's my comments. So much. I hope that didn't take too much time. No, I've heard that over good. the years, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Appreciate uh, your uh, comments and um, uh, and your work over the years in this area. Uh, Rodden Turner is next. Okay. James Bradford the third. Uh, I, I, uh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, okay, it looks like we have uh, Rod in here. Welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm James Rafford III. Um, I took this time just basically go off a view or a site that I've seen. Uh, we're taking public transportation. Um, so definitely appreciate putting this session together. I think it's a great way to sort of get more engaged with the citizens and also a way to build a bridge with the council more to the everyday people that take public transportation or housing. Uh, but one of the things that I've noticed of taking public transportation and the new line that's being built and the bus shelters that are being put, um, which I think is phenomenal how quick they've been put up but one of the things that I've seen and noticed is that the shelters are built, but there isn't bus schedules on them. And the way I thought of it is thinking about an everyday person maybe um, doesn't have a phone, or maybe they're running late, especially in Minnesota, it gets cold, it's winter time, and they're actually depending on the bus coming late and on time to get where they need to go. You know, sometimes those things don't happen the way that they should, especially being in Minnesota. 
So I thought about individuals, maybe someone is coming from the grocery store, multiple bags, and actually they get them and say, I don't know what time the bus is coming, you know, or a mother or a father that has children and doesn't have available hands to actually get on their phone and actually check these kind of things. And I think about it just, just the council that you touch so many different sectors of residents in St. Paul and actually the county and the state to think about why if there's maybe a closer bridge to people and understanding how the everyday people use this, that you will see that the, the shelters built is great and it's phenomenal, but the missing piece of it is the times and the schedules and how that affects everyday people. So just seeing the shelters built, and I thought it was great because I actually can picture when they're actually, those new buses get running and I hope they're electric buses that affects people that ride the bus and don't. It's a great benefit to all citizens. But the piece that I was missing was just where those schedules at. And I didn't think of it personally myself because I can get on my phone and look, but it made me think and project other individuals that maybe don't have a phone, maybe individuals that's homeless, and they're maybe trying to get to the bus to get to their next warm opportunity in our state, but they don't know when the bus is coming. And even to just see the, the divert parts if the bus is late or on time. So I just wanted to take this time and I appreciate it just to sort of something I've seen and experienced and I hope you take the view that I got. I took myself out of it and thought about other individuals and how to affect other individuals with something that small. And even just taking the time to listen to me maybe make you think maybe I should take the bus one time and see if there's something that not done on purpose but maybe something that can improve something for all citizens and residents regardless if they take public transportation or not. Um, but thank you for my, your time and you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And uh, certainly as a bus rider, I, uh, I can relate to what you're talking about. Um, Kevin Sands, and then I'll say the person after Kevin, just so we can move things along. Uh, Sean uh, Gzuski is after him. Kevin? Okay. And for those of you who are here and, and um, signed up but don't want to testify, um, you know, you're always welcome to send your comments, written comments, or send an email. Um, we have a, a site uh, for, for this task force, and, and we are collecting public comments and writing. So I just wanted to make that announcement. Um, uh, Kevin, you kind of reminded me of that. So uh, we want to make sure, again, that people, even if they're not testifying, but even if they have a thought here, even the next few weeks, uh, please share those with us. Okay, we have a guy uh, who is handing stuff out, but Sean, just in the interest of time, if you could come on up and uh, state your name for the record, proceed with your testimony, and I'm gonna give you three minutes just because we've had um, some people cancel here, so okay. you have till 317. Hello, Sean Grzeski. My voice is um, getting better, but I, Handed out in red writing so you can see it as well. <clears throat> I live in South Minneapolis near the High Lake Light Rail, and I work with about 50 metro cities on their climate goals. For example, we met up with uh, about 10 of the Ramsey County cities last night, and they're very excited to work on climate solutions, but they feel like they need more guidance on what exactly you can do, um, specific actions for each bucket of carbon, like reducing natural gas with buildings or you know, residential commercial buildings. So I think the, the Met Council has been providing tools, but they're all pretty much like just kind of passive um, voluntary tools. And we need to really structure the actions, get the money lined up behind the actions, help the cities work together collaboratively to get the actions done. So I think an elected Met Council would have the both the mandate from their residents to work on these things, but also they would have the time, if they're paid well, to be able to actually go into depth on these topics, to be able to meet with external stakeholders and experts, to meet with the different departments. Right now, the poor my council members have other jobs. They don't have time to really figure out this stuff, so they just trust whatever the department staff tell them. And the department staff are very timid to try to actually go and lead on things. And we really need to, many of these issues, affordable housing, transit safety, climate change, affordable housing, they need more stronger leadership. And so I think we can push that through the electoral process 
with an elected Met Council with well supported that has time to work on these things. And the final thing is I wanna see the state of Minnesota, the Met Council, Hennepin County, Minneapolis using the same platform to implement their climate action plans. So it's not a different little PDF sitting on somebody's desk. It should be all on the same shared management platform. You can see the different funding pots. If you get these gigantic federal grants, you can implement them easier. So we have a suggested platform on the second page here. And I would love to meet up with you guys on how to try to have a synchronized approach to implementation of the climate action plans. So because most of the issues require action on many different levels of government. So let's synchronize it up. Um, thank you. And um, I appreciate uh, both your testimony and then also we have your uh, written comments uh, and these will also be written into the record as well. So thank you for the testimony. Uh, next, we have Mary Watson and then Jessica Lee. If Mary or Jessica are here. Okay. Um, Aliyah Tova, Gorman Bear. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe there's some confusion with the uh, attendee and sign up sheet, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll work on that. Um, I did see Thomas Beaumont. I don't know if he's uh, interested in testifying either. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we're moving right along then. I, I should have had everyone testify for 10 minutes. I don't know. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, just joking. Just, just kidding. Um, John McMillan. Okay. Uh, Colin Anderson. Okay. Welcome. Thank you for testifying. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for hosting this event. Uh, my name is Colin Anderson. Uh, I live in Hamlin Midway of St. Paul. Um, I work in uh, food justice. Uh, and food security, that literally being the foundation of all existence, probably an important thing. Um, I first really began to understand the uh, Met Council, actually through a conversation with my city council person, Mitra Jalali. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting thing. Um, and uh, I guess I'd like to just start with a quick quote from uh, James Howard Kunstler's Long Economy, 2005. The dirty secret of the American economy was that it was no longer about anything except the creation of suburban sprawl and the furnishing, accessorizing, and financing of it. And with that, I would say, what's, what's so great? I mean, who's looking around this world right now? Our political landscape, all of it, the trillions of dollars, uh, the fiscally um, irresponsible have spent since 1980 to have our roads at 42% deteriorated, um, no decent regional rail. Uh, you know, our buses run less than they used to. And yes, you know, as my, my great friend Abu had spoken, you know, our neighborhood was destroyed after George Floyd was murdered. And I understand that. I understand that. And that when it stood up, when we had to come together for each other, it was community that came together. It was not the corporations. And as we sit here and continue to spend more money at a time where our country is being destroyed by division, and we built a city where it is almost dangerous to get around without being isolated in your little panic room on wheels, that's a problem. Because from community, everything else will be provided. And when we specifically design cities where it is not safe to not be in your little metal rocket where you can hurt others, hurt yourself, and quite honestly be spewing endless environmental racism and unsustainable public costs to just keep us isolated. And right now, our governor is chairman of the Democratic government, Governors uh, Coalition, I believe that is. I'm represented by someone who is just on NBC. Okay, 
I am not a community leader. All of you are elected representatives or appointed, you know, but I'm a member of a leading community and the eyes are on Minnesota. And when is Minnesota gonna stand up and say, great, let us be the example? Where are the big ideas? Where are we getting people involved? We just passed a tax increase in Minnesota with 29, or in St. Paul with 29,000 votes. That's 10% of the population of St. Paul. Nobody's even involved. Nobody's excited because it's the same old failed plans over and over and over again. Okay, I've emailed my mayor 20 times without even an acknowledgement at a time where he came to our neighborhood me uh, council meeting two years ago and said, send me your big ideas. And I did that. And the Metro Council has been, I, I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful that Mitra has been able to educate me on, yeah, I, I got onto this thing and this is how it operates and nobody knows how it's operating. But it is operated in a way where we can go around and say, it's failed. It's failed us. This whole thing has failed, and when are we going to get the courage to respect ourselves, our neighborhoods, and our communities enough to no longer settle for mediocrity and just more wasted money, wasted tax money, on a crumbling Cold War era transportation system that serves no one, that makes it where we can't access the necessary resources because they're not put in communities. They're built in a suburban model where you have to drive there, where you have a big parking lot that none of it's used, and we're all just isolated. And transit is the number one way that we can sit there to encourage people to be in community, to be walking, because the streets are safe. And I, I want to acknowledge right now, I have an incredible amount of privilege. And I have been able to be to cities like Tokyo, cities like Berlin, uh, Vienna, Budapest, that have incredibly well-developed transportation systems and a philosophy of communalism that brings people together to act in their best interest. And with that, I would like to also end with one last quote, because you can't have a meeting like this without saying bell hooks. It is important for this country to make its people so obsessed with their own liberal individualism that they do not have the time to think about a world larger than self. And I think the Metro Council has an incredible opportunity to think about a world larger than themselves. Thank you for your testimony, appreciate it. Um, so we have a couple more folks uh, that have either signed up or just signed up as attendees or testifiers. Um, Jerome Johnson, and then after that, Matthews Holland's head. Welcome. Uh, as, uh, as Mr. Hornstein mentioned, my name is Jerome Johnson. I, I'm here uh, <clears throat> uh, as part of the uh, CART organization that Jim Shetler represented earlier, uh, Citizen Advocates for Regional Transit. I kind of fell in with Jim way, way back in the beginning of the Riverview days when we shared a concern about the performance of that system uh, being run down the middle of West 7th. My own background is as a so-called transportation economist where uh, for most of my civilian working career, I bought and sold railroad lines and associated rail corridors. Did about 60 or 70 of those deals. You may recognize one of them ended up as the Lake Wobegon Trail or at least uh, the eastern third of it. And there are others around the country. I'm here to basically build on Jim's remarks plus something Russ Stark said earlier and then uh, uh, one of the gentlemen before me, uh, as to how a more responsive governments, uh, governance authority can lead to a restructuring of tasks and authorities uh, uh, in the Met Council that can go further and get, and get things done in a better way. That is, specifically, if there were an elected Met Council, if there were a Council of Governments, uh, structure to the Met Council, you could, among other things, establish a true metro-wide regional rail authority that in turn would facilitate a true, truly effective regional transit network. That is, you could go so far as to fold all these county regional rail authorities into one uh, underneath this uh, restructured Met Council, more answerable to uh, 
to the communities. And such an organization would have uh, three key tasks. Uh, number one, it could plan, design, and implement a true regional fixed guideway transit system, focusing on higher speed, light rail and bus transit, focusing on, which would in turn, focus on mobility and related equity outcomes, uh, focusing on inter-county applications that may not be of interest to existing rail authorities. Now, why is that so important? Uh, briefly, there are too many light rail applications that produce little or no user mobility. And if they promote little or no user mobility, if the light rail applications are going no faster than a good bus rapid transit system, or even not much faster than express bus or local bus, it's hard to see any equity coming from that. Um, I can give you an example in uh, the uh, planned Riverview line at 16 miles an hour for major OD pairs. It's no faster than bus rapid transit at orders of magnitude more cost. Uh, the relocated blue line extension, same deal. 16 miles an hour when uh, it'll be no faster than a good bus rapid transit system. In my view, a consolidated restructured rail, regional rail authority can uh, work to mitigate that. Second task, evaluate and secure available rights away when they come available that may be of little interest to uh, these county regional rail authorities uh, or, uh, or may span counties and therefore be of little interest. These would focus on abandoned or low utilization rights away, focus on inter county rights away, as I mentioned, and be available to pounce when available leverage on the freight railroad comes to pass. Why is that important? In my view, we fumbled the golden opportunity when the Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern Railway merger came along to secure abandoned or little utilized right of ways through. Uh, through the heart of this area, uh, the uh, Highland Park CP spur, uh, the Midtown Greenway extension that I think we could have had with more focus. Third task, optimize trackside land use with regional freight logistics and rail corridor right-of-way deployment. What, all, what that simply means is uh, such a consolidated more responsive regional rail authority could ensure that trackside land best suited for freight rail oriented deployment remains in freight rail deployment and trackside land that can easily assume higher and better use can find its way into that higher and better use so that the so-called CP spur serving Highland Bridge can be taken over by a public entity that can put take your pick, whether it's a trail or a light rail line or something of that matter, uh, that makes more sense than waiting for a petrochemical refinery or something to come along and be located. In, in my estimate, there are, all the, there are over 30 miles or over 200 acres of those sorts of opportunities in this town that I think are better realized with a more consolid, consolidated uh, Regional Freight Rail Authority. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and then our last testifier. First of all, before I call up uh, Matthews Holland, said, is there anyone else that didn't sign up uh, and wants to testify or did sign up and change their mind? Okay. So we'll have uh, you can come up after Matthews Holland said, and then that will be our last uh, last testifier for the day. Comes after Matthews. Thank you, and um, when you uh, approach the podium or start your testimony, let us know if you have any uh, organizational affiliation that you'd like noted for the record. Welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Hollinsett. I am a transit modal representative on the Transit Advisory Board. I'm a past board member of the Highland District Council in St. Paul. I'm the conservation chair of the North Star chapter of the Sierra Club, and I have advocated for transit in various other roles for 30 years. But today I am speaking as uh, one more of the six conveners of the discussion group that we call Citizen Advocates for Regional Transit, or CART. Um, 
If you travel from Stillwater to Prior Lake or Hastings to Blaine or Maple Grove to Maplewood, it's a one seat, prepaid, continuous trip, as long as you drive or ride in a personal motor vehicle. If you take transit, these trips take one to several transfers, are partially or fully pay when you board, or cannot be made at all by transit. The regional question here, I submit, is why? When you drive, you don't change cars when you change roads. You don't swipe a fare card or put money in a meter. Why is there this disparity in convenience and efficiency, I, I submit, is in major part a matter of regional governance. As my colleagues have already noted, the planning of major transit routes is not regional. I agree with Commissioner Reinhardt that transit planning should therefore be centralized in the Met Council. I greatly respect the work that counties have done, did do, some years ago in breaking the stalemate over light rail to get the blue and the green line uh, planned, built, and operating. But more recently, planning has become less regional. Where I live in Highland Park in St. Paul, the Riverview Corridor, which a transit task force on which I served in 1999 identified almost a quarter century ago, still has no transit way and no continuity into the greater East Metro. How does this relate to metropolitan governance? I think and we think that a proportionately elected Met Council with staggered terms overseeing a centralized planning, construction, and operation of transit will be best equipped to answer the question I pose here. Why is it that less convenient to travel the entire region by transit than in a personal vehicle? We are quite concerned that a council of governments would be less equipped than either our current council or a proportionally elected council to develop parity and mobility between personal motor vehicles and transit. By definition, local elected officials' primary obligation is to their direct constituents and jurisdictions, and it is certain that conflicts will occur. And finally, I want to mention something about equity. Um, the AAA says that uh, personal vehicles cost an average of $12,000 a year to uh, own and operate. And as spread out as we are in households with more than one job, more than one schedule, more than one vehicle, that adds up to a huge, huge part of the household income. There's been a lot of talk, and I agree with it, about housing. Uh, taking too much uh, household income, but what about motor vehicles? We have the most expensive transportation system in the world here in the U.S. and in this metro, and that's why. So I strongly support and we strongly support a proportionally elected Met Council with staggered terms that's directly accountable to the public so that it will have a lot more credibility and hope for hopefully a lot more ability to implement a truly regional transit system. So thank you for the opportunity to thank, uh, testify. Thank you so much, and thank you for all of your work over the years on these issues. So we have one last testifier, and, uh, uh, and then we will uh, adjourn for the weekend. Sorry. Welcome, and uh, thanks for coming, and state your name for the record, and proceed with your testimony, and again, any organizational affiliations yeah. you have, too. Definitely, and I recognize I'm the one keeping you from your weekend, so I will be very brief. Um, my name is Amanda Dewar. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs with the St. Paul Area Chamber. Um, in a prior life, I was a staff with uh, the Legislative Transportation Committee, and know that this conversation has been going on for a very long time, but this has been like the most serious and organized that it's ever been. So just wanna thank you all for your efforts and um, think it's a good conversation to have. Um, the chamber doesn't have a specific preference of the organizational structure, but we do agree with many of the speakers and our elected officials here today that um, accountability to the citizens and local communities um, should be improved in this process. Um, 
these are very specific, you know, services that are being provided, whether it be water or transit. And so gubernatorial appointments for like service delivery level doesn't make a great deal of sense. Um, agree with council member Jalali and also Russ about bringing it closer to local government, make it easier for citizens to have input on um, projects and just be able to talk to their council member. And um, also agree with Commissioner Reinert that some things do just make sense that they have to be regional. We can't have every single county and every single city doing these various operations that there does need to be a level of coordination. Um, personally, I think some level of a council of government makes sense. And I do have to say, I watched one of your previous hearings and loved the Dr. Cog. And so if we go that way, we need to come up with a fun acronym for whatever the Twin Cities comes up with. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And uh, it's wonderful to see you again. I believe you were the committee administrator under Senator Murphy. Is that correct? Research step. Research OK. All right. It was a long time ago, but uh, at least I got the that part. So uh, before we uh, adjourn, um, uh, Amanda Dewar said that we were um, serious and organized. And there's one reason we're serious and organized, and that is our incredible staff person, uh, Taylor Kohler, who uh, did so much to make this day happen and has uh, kept this task force on task and um, really moving us along. So a big thank you to, uh, to Taylor. and. Um, and the four folks that got us started today, you really uh, were very so insightful. Each of you has a, a really specific perspective that is really valued and just appreciate all of your work in the community over many, many years. So a big thank you and yes. And, um, and to our task force members and the public that made it out here, um, we, uh, that's very appreciated. Just a quick announcement, we'll be doing another uh, meeting uh, like this uh, on Thursday at noon um, in Lake Elmo at the Lake Elmo City Hall. And I wanna thank Representative Weens and uh, Commissioner Bingham for uh, uh, helping uh, get that one going. And then we'll be in Minneapolis and Shakopee in January. And so um, again, appreciate that. Any Anything you would like to say, Mr. Vice Chair? Okay, well with that, um, have a great weekend and this meeting, uh, public meeting of the uh, Metropolitan uh, Council Governance Task Force is adjourned. Recording stopped.